This was the, he's written a whole chain of books, uh, all of which are incredibly racy and wonderful reads about subjects you wouldn't have even imagined existed. Um, strange uh, figures in Japanese history uh, who turn out to be from London um, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. Uh, wonderful stories of uh, uh, the last days of uh, Smyrna and the fall of the city. Um, uh, his current uh, book is uh, 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 called The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which is uh, uh, the, the kind of dirty tricks department in the uh, 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 British Secret Service during World War II. But of all the books uh, we could have had him speak about, I asked him to speak about his first book, and the book that really broke him uh, as a major writer, um, because in many ways it's the most extraordinary of all, and it's certainly the one that I think that will speak uh, to people here. So uh, please give a loud uh, applause for Giles Milton. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I think we could move straight on to the first slide. Um, in, in fact, the second slide, the next one, please. So this, I suppose, is the, this is the most in, important um, character in the book, really. Um, a fleshy little fruit, about the size of an apricot, um, greenish uh, yellow, very little scent when it's on the tree, but the tree itself is a rather beautiful, willowy little tree. Um, and the, the fleshy fruit, um, well, to the botanists of the time, it was known as Myristica fragrance. But to the sea dogs, the merchant adventurers of London, this was known as nutmeg. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. Now, if you peel off that fleshy fruit that surrounds, that surrounds the thing, um, inside you get this. Um, the red is known as mace, um, which is quite pungent, quite aromatic uh, spice. But um, it very quickly loses its aroma and loses its taste. And what the merchants of London were particularly interested in is to be found in the next slide, please. This, of course, is nutmeg. Um, this was very valuable in Elizabethan times, and if you could bring some of this back um, from the East Indies, from the fabled East Indies, you could make yourself very rich indeed. Um, in the East Indies, 10 pounds of nutmeg cost less than one English penny. In London, it sold for 2 pounds 10 shillings. That's a monumental markup. So you only have to bring a bit of this back, and you have made yourself seriously uh, wealthy. But why um, was it so valuable? What was it about this kind of withered little nut that most people have in the back of their larders and bring out once a year for mulled wine at Christmas? Um, well, if we can have the next, uh, next slide. This explains something, this picture, worth looking at quite closely. Um, look at Queen Elizabeth I's hand there, gently sort of caressing the globe. Um, look in the background at those ships setting sail for, for somewhere exotic. This, of course, is um, the, la the, 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 the golden age, as it was to be known. Sorry. To the mic, OK, sorry. Um, this was the golden, what was to be known as the golden age of exploration. Um, Bold-hearted uh, sea captains and mariners started setting off across the world to explore new lands with the encouragement and sometimes the financial backing of the Queen. Um, there had been Sir Martin Frobisher had gone and explored the Arctic in, in, in 1576. Um, a few years later, well, one year later, Sir Francis Drake, of course, had set off on his fabulous um, circumnavigation of the globe, a voyage that took three years. There had been voyages to North America as well. In, in 1584, the first great um, expedition to North America to, settle, to try and settle Virginia. Um, so the Queen had very much um, backed, backed these uh, voyages to these far-flung lands. And when they got to these far-flung lands, they found um, exotica, they found rarities, they found things that could command fabulous value when they got back to London. And captains were forever being asked to bring back rare and wonderful things from the East. Um, here's a quote from one sea captain was asked, remember to do your best to bring for the Lord of Salisbury some parrots, marmosets, or other strange beasts and fowls that you esteem rare and delightful. But the rarest of all was nutmeg. Um, it became a status symbol um, it became a thing, a luxury for the very, very wealthy. Um, and luxury, of course, was really coming into its own in the Elizabethan court and the surroundings of the court. You can see Elizabeth's splendid costume there. 
And nutmeg was so rare and so valuable precisely because it came from so far away, um, from the other side of the planet. If we could have the next slide, please. But nutmeg was not just about extravagance. It was also believed to have extraordinary medicinal properties, um, one of which was to, it was believed it could cure the plague, the pestiferous pestilence, as it was known. <laughs> and people in London actually used to wear these extraordinary masks on their faces. And the beak there was filled with spices, was filled with nutmeg, with cloves, with cinnamon, with pepper. And then you breathed through this mask, and it was believed quite wrongly that it would stop you getting the plague. And it wasn't just um, curative properties that uh, nutmeg was supposed to have. It was also said, of course, to be an aphrodisiac. This was the Viagra of the Elizabethan age, and that simply pushed its price up um, even higher. So this, um, this withered little nut was going to boost your libido if you took enough of it. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So one of the, the, the allure of nutmeg, as I said, was its rarity. And it really did uh, only come, uh, could only be found on the far side of the globe. Now here you see a, a contemporary map of the globe. So ships sailing from London, they'd have to sh sail down uh, the English Channel and then down the coast of Africa. But it's not so, just as simple as going south because you have to follow the trade winds. So the ships would have to go almost over to the coast of Brazil and then backwards to the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of southern Africa. And once they were there, they'd try and um, acquire food and water and then set off into the Indian Ocean, which um, was really almost unknown at that time, unmapped for the uh, English sea dogs who were sailing there. They had no idea where the, where the coral reefs, the shoals, and, and what have you were. So it was an extremely dangerous uh, voyage. But if you made it across the Indian Ocean, and the Dutch and the Portuguese didn't capture you en route, because of course these seas at this time were particularly the preserve of the Portuguese, if they didn't capture you, if you made it there, you didn't sink, um, then you would arrive at the Moluccas. Next slide, please. So these were what was known as the fabled spiceries. That's how they were called in London at the time. Now they comprise of the vast um, extent of Indonesia, of Malaysia, Singapore, that whole area of the world were known um, as the spiceries. There was the islands of Ternate and Tidore. They were vol volcanic islands where cloves and cinnamon grew. There was Sumatra, which was famous for its pepper. Um, there was Ambon, there was Saram. And there was the great spice market, the international spice market at Bantam in Java. And this is where you wanted to come um, if you were to acquire some of these um, precious commodities, and I will be coming back to that at the moment. But if we could just have the next slide, please. So that was a modern uh, map of the region. This is what your Elizabethan sea captain would have with him in his cabin. Um, it is highly inaccurate, and little wonder, really, that um, in the early days, two out of every three ships disappeared without trace and were never seen again. <laughs> Because it was not just, um, uh, of course there were shoals and reefs and, uh, which, which brought dangers, but there was also the monsoon, uh, and Elizabethan sea captains ha had no concept of the monsoon and just how dangerous it was. So this caught them unawares in the early voyages to the uh, Spice Islands. If we could have the next one, please. Now, even in the Spice Islands, nutmeg was an extremely elusive and rare plant. Um, it was extremely fussy about climate. It needed a particular microclimate, in fact, for it to thrive. And it also needed a particular type of rich volcanic soil. And so in 1600, at the time of, uh, that we're talking about, nutmeg actually only grew in six, on six islands in the entire world. And that is what you can see in this map here. This is the Banda Archipelago. And um, with the volcano, you can see spurting uh, fire and smoke at the top of the picture there. Um, a couple of other big islands. Um, but I'd like you to look for one moment at the islands on the far left of the screen, Pulau Run and Pulau Ai. These two islands were to be um, extremely significant um, in the story of what is to come. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Um, this is a modern map, of, obviously, of the Bandar Islands, and it shows just how inaccurate uh, that Elizabethan map is. So you can see there's a cluster of main islands, and this is the geography of the islands are going to be very important in our story. There's a cluster of main islands there with a volcano, and note I Island, AI, and Run Island far to the west. Um, these are the islands we're going to be sailing to a little bit later. They are, I have to say, they're staggeringly beautiful islands. They're still covered in groves of nutmeg trees. They, they, you can, in the time of the harvest, you can smell the islands before you arrive at them. This pungent smell of nutmeg, which is put out to dry on the foreshores. Um, there are also remains on most of the islands of the old Dutch and English forts there, these huge stone, stone fortresses now crumbling to pieces. Cannon still lying there, rusty cannon. And um, you, know, you can even run your hand through the sand and scoop up musket shot that's been left over from the dark events that took place here some 400 years ago. But first, we're going to go on to the next slide because our story takes a rather strange twist at this point. Uh, we need to meet this man here who is called Sir Hugh Willoughby. Um, a lot of you will know something of the story of the East India Company, particularly the later years when, of course, it was focused on India. But it, a company like the East India Company doesn't spring from nowhere. It's born out of something. And it is specifically born out of a disaster, um, a spectacular disaster led by this man here, uh, Sir Hugh Willoughby, which also proved to be a spectacular um, success. So we'll have a look at his, um, his voyage. You see, the obvious route as I said on the map uh, we saw earlier, was to go down uh, through the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Cape of Good Hope, across the Indian Ocean. Um, that was the obvious route. But all the ports, all the watering holes, all the places where you could expect to get food and replenish your supplies, most of those had already got forts that had been built by the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Dutch. So Sir Hugh Willoughby went back to his maps and he had what he thought was an absolutely brilliant idea. And it will, we'll see it in the next slide, please. He decided that instead of sailing south to the Spice Islands, why not sail north? Why not go up the coast of Norway, across the top of Russia, Muscovy, and then down south again, and that would bring you down to the Spiceries, geographically correct. Um, and also, it would be a far shorter route, and that you wouldn't meet any of the hated Dutch and Portuguese or, en route. So um, he decided that this would be um, a very good thing to try. And he set off in, in the 1550s, him with one other ship run by Richard Chancellor, and off they set to the north. Next slide, please. Well, all went relatively well at the beginning. Um, the, the, they got over the top of um, Nordcap, which is the top of Norway. Um, they started sailing along the coast of Russia. And they even found it was quite easy to get, you know, replenish their food supplies en route because they could kill polar bears. Um, and it was all going swimmingly until about November when, next slide please, um, the temperature plummeted it became extremely cold and the sea began to freeze. Well, the men kept hunting, they kept being able to um, keep themselves alive. But um, then it got colder and even colder. Next slide, please. And what happens to water when um, it freezes? Of course, it expands. So what happens to Sir Hugh Willoughby's ship? There's an awful crunching, creaking noise and the ship splits under the sheer pressure of the ice. And um, Willoughby's men are trapped in an Arctic wilderness. Uh, the polar bears have all gone. There's no food. And tragically, they all die and are not found for several months. And here's the account of the people who found them. They found them completely frozen. We found them, goes the report, on the Muscovy coast. And they were frozen, pen still in hand. And the paper before them, others at table, platter in hand and spoon in mouth like statues, as if they'd been placed in these attitudes. So Willoughby's um, voyage was obviously a complete disaster. But what of the second ship? Well, Richard Chancellor had fared rather better. He'd managed to put into shore somewhere near where Archangel is now. And he trudged through the winter snow um, all the way to um, Moscow, where he was met by, next slide please, where he was met by Ivan the Terrible. He was granted an audience um, with Ivan the Terrible. And these two men managed to thrash out a trading agreement that led to the birth of the Muscovy Company. Um, this was the foundation of the Muscovy Company. And if we could have the next slide, please. 
Um, this was a precursor of the East India Company. It was the first major sort of international trading company that was to spread the risk of investment um, so that you didn't, if you lost your ship, um, you, didn't, you wouldn't lose all your money because people were sharing it. It wasn't quite the joint stock um, commodity uh, or, or, or enterprise that the East India Company was, but it was very similar to that. So it was very much a forerunner of the East India Company. If we could have the next... Slide, please. So we now move forward to 1600, um, New Year's Eve 1600. Um, the Queen Elizabeth I finally signs a charter granting a group of merchant adventurers, as they were called, um, the right to exploit and sail to the East Indies um, to the fabled spiceries. And this man is the first governor of the East India Company, a man called Sir Thomas Smythe. He was um, a, a shrewd businessman, a, wealthy, a very wealthy man, very well connected, um, knew everyone in London at the time, everyone important, and he'd already been heavily involved in trying to plant settlers in Virginia, so he knew a lot about the risks um, of long sea voyages. Um, so he, he helped put together the money, the financial package, um, which would help the first expedition set sail, which was to be five ships under the command of this man here. If we could have the next slide, please. So. This is Sir James Lancaster. He was to be the pioneering captain of the pioneering first expedition to the East Indies. Um, he was what you might call a safe pair of hands. He sailed a lot in the past. He knew what he was doing. Again, see him caressing the globe, the ship in the background, the familiar, the familiar um, icons that they like to put in these, in these pictures. He was, by all accounts, there's a lot of journal, his own journals and letters about him, he was a rather gruff old sea dog um, and a stern moralizer. He insisted on having regular daily prayer meetings on board his ship, and um, he instituted a very severe regime. Uh, he said, against the blaspheming of the name of God and all idle and filthy communications. But he was a good captain, he was firm, he was fair, and he achieved something quite remarkable, actually. Um, the, one of the great dangers on these long sea voyages was scurvy. And Sir James Lancaster realized that if, you, if he gave his men a teaspoon of lemon juice every morning, that none of them got scurvy. And on his voyage, no one died of scurvy. They died of plenty of other things, but not of scurvy. And what's remarkable about this is it was forgotten for the next 150 years. And it wasn't actually until Captain Cook set sail um, that, the, that treating scurvy with vitamin C, with lemon juice, um, was, uh, w w came back in, basically. Um, if we could have the next. So this is his ship. This is his flagship. This is the, the Red Dragon. Um, he was sailing with five ships to the East Indies. This was by far the biggest. But it was only a ship of 600 tons. I mean, if you imagine sort of four or five buses parked end to end, that is um, the size of a ship that you're going to be on for about three years. And remember, this ship has to carry um, food, uh, food, enough food to feed all the men on board. It has to carry, well, they didn't really carry water. They carried beer because it, uh, it lasted for longer. Um, and, and on this ship were crowded a huge number of men because the death toll was so high that they had to take far more men than they actually uh, needed for the, exhibition, uh, for the expedition. So um, Lancaster's voyage, he knew it would be a trial, and it certainly was. It, things began to go wrong once they reached the southern Atlantic because there was that awful thing happened known as the doldrums. The ship landed in the doldrums and there was no wind at all. And they drifted listlessly for weeks and weeks and weeks, consuming all of the food that they had on board. So they were in a pretty desperate state by the time they reached the Cape of Good Hope. Next slide, please. So here is um, a picture of the uh, local, the native inhabitants that they found um, on the Cape of Good Hope. And according to all the journals and letters that they wrote, they, 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 they sort of rubbed their eyes in disbelief at what they found. And this is the account of Patrick Copland, who was the, the vicar on board, the, uh, on board the ship. He described the local population as very brutish savages who wear only a short cloak of sheep or seal skin, hairy side, side inward, and a rat skin about their privities. He was even more shocked to discover that the women folk also wore a rat skin around their privities, and when they saw this vicar on board, they used to lift up their rat skin to shock him even more. 
Now, it, it should be said that Elizabethan uh, adventurers and sailors and sea dogs were not um, traveling the world with open minds. So um, one of the characteristic features of their journals and their letters is um, a, a rather appalling attitude to the local uh, population, indigenous populations that they, they meet en route. If we could have the next slide, please. Now, having re replenished their supplies at the Cape of Good Hope, they then had to round the Cape, because they put in at Table Bay, they had to then round the Cape. And this was one of the most dangerous stretches of sea on the entire voyage. It was always incredibly rough. There were numerous storms, and many of the ships that were lost were lost um, in this stretch of water here. And James Lancaster was no exception to experiencing a truly terrible storm on, as he rounded the Cape. And he at the height of the storm, he went down into his cabin and he wrote lines to his bosses in the East India Company and they were lines that were sort of inspired the Victorian imperialists who went on to write the uh, account of the East India Company. They found that this summed up everything that was good about um, these early imperial adventurers. He said, as he was uh, going, being battered by this storm, I cannot tell where you should look for me, he said, because I live at the devotion of the winds and the seas. Now, next slide, please. He survived the Cape of Good Hope, and he arrived at what his sailors referred to as Achin. Um, this was in Sumatra, where the local sultan went out of his way to welcome the arrival of the Red Dragon and the other four ships. He presently sent six great elephants with many trumpets, drums, streamers, and many people. There's rather more elephants, obviously, in this picture, but um, Sir James Lancaster said that the biggest elephant had a huge seat that was strapped to its back, and in the middle of this seat was a great basin of gold. And inside this basin, James put this. If we could see the next slide, please. Sir James Lancaster put this. Now, this was a letter that Queen Elizabeth I had written to, well, not to the Sultan, in fact, because she didn't know who ruled any of these places that they were going to. So Sir James Lancaster was carrying about 30 of these letters, and it sort of said, dear blank, and when he got somewhere, he'd find out the name of the local ruler and fill it in. <laughs> in this case, it was uh, Sultan, Sultan Allah Uddin, um, and so that was quickly filled in by, uh, by James Lancaster. The, the letter described him as our loving brother and glorified him for his humane and noble usage of strangers. There was then a, a pat paragraph about damning the Spanish and the Portuguese, the dread, you know, dreaded Catholics. Um, and then it got down to the substance, trade, it says. Not only breeds intercourse and exchange of merchandise, but engenders love and friendship betwixt all men. Henceforth, the Sultan became a great friend of the English, and Sumatra would become a key stopping off point um, for all English vessels that sailed to the East Indies. There was one little hiccup when the Sultan said, actually, on the next voyage, he'd like to have a couple of English uh, maidens for his harem. Um, and this, this was duly sent back to London, and um, it caused all sorts of problems, because could you send two? That was sort of condoning bigamy, um, and it was felt not quite right. But then a, a London uh, merchant offered his daughter, he said she's very good at needlework and she'd be great to go out there. Luckily, <laughs> luckily King James I overruled this, and Sultan Allah Uddin never got his, his lovely English maidens. Now, if we could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> So from, from, um, from uh, Sumatra, James Lancaster headed his ships to this place here. Um, this is called Bantam, and this is on Java. Um, you can see ships fighting here. And this, the Bay of Bantam, was one of the places where the English and Dutch uh, were forever coming to blows over uh, their quest to uh, dominate the spice market. Um, Bantam was... Um, uh, 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 it was a place where you had to come to um, buy, buy spices. It was the principal international center for spice trades. If we could have the next slide, please. So this is the town itself, looking rather orderly with its neat streets, and uh, it looks rather well kept here. But Bantam was anything but. It was surrounded, the whole city, the vast city, was surrounded by malarial swampland and marshland. It was filthy, it was insanitary, and it was known by all the English mariners as that stinking stew. One sea dog, and many, many people, many sea dogs died here. You know, they arrived here already incredibly weak. Um, one said, Bantam is not a place to recover men that are sick, but rather to kill men that come thither in health. <laughs> 
that they'd come here to trade, and if we could have the next slide, please. Um, Bantam was truly an international uh, city, but Lancaster found a great problem when he arrived here getting trading privileges because the ruler of Bantam was a young boy and the city had been carved up between any number of local rulers. Here you see one of them um, traveling through the town with a local militia. It was absolute chaos um, and in a virtual state of civil war with um, all sorts of competing factions. If I go to the next sli slide, please. But here is the reason why everyone came here. This was the bustling spice market um, that lay at the heart of Bantam. This was of such importance um, in the whole region. People came from as far afield as China and Japan to come and buy spices here. And Lancaster realized that, um, well, he realized the problem that every time a sh an English ship was going to sail into port, the price of spices were going to, was going to dramatically rocket. So he thought, well, the best thing was to leave some men behind to establish what was known as a factory. This was not a factory in the modern sense. It was more a trading warehouse, a depot, if you like. So when in, the, in, in, the, in the times when spices were cheap, when there was a glut of spices, his men could buy loads of them, stock them up in the warehouse, and then when the ship came around, load up and sail back to London. Quick turnover, massive profit. Um, so that was the idea. Lancaster left behind three men, William Starkey, Edmund Scott, and Thomas Morgan. And these were to find themselves in one of the most challenging um, economic trading markets in the world. Um, because there was not just the, the climate, the, the disease, but there was the attacks from the, from the uh, Dutch, Portuguese, and also from the Chinese, particularly. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, Violence and torture was commonplace. Frequent, very nasty torture, um, which was used as both a punishment and as a deterrent. Now, this picture here actually shows an Englishman being tortured by the Dutch. Um, this is a very early form of waterboarding. What you did, you tied a canvas sack around somebody's head and then poured water into it. And the only way to stop yourself from drowning was to keep drinking. And there are horrific accounts. You can sort of see his stomach there beginning to expand of people just, just they describe them as huge bladders of water um, uh, sticking out from their body as they kept drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, so the, 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 the men left behind had a very difficult time, obviously, uh, chaos, uh, anarchy in, in Bantam. But Edmund Scott, one of the men, kept a diary of absolutely everything that happened. And this was one of the resources, many resources in the archives that I, I used. It makes for absolutely fascinating but very uncomfortable reading. And because it's a, it's a litany of violence, of, of torture, of sickness, of the factory coming under attack um, from their trading rivals, with the Chinese particularly trying to burn it down on a regular basis. Scott writes, oh, this word, fire, had it been spoken near me, either in English or Malay or J Javanese or Chinese, although I had been asleep, yet I should have leapt out of my bed. Now, on one occasion, Edmund Scott captured one of the arsonists, and he punished him in the style of the time, um, recording the torture in a totally matter-of-fact way in his diary. And I'll read out just a couple of lines, but this runs to three pages of his diary. He says, First, I caused him to be burned under the nails of his thumbs, fingers, and toes with a sharp hot iron, and then the nails were torn off. Then we burned him quite through the hands and with rasps of iron tore out the flesh and the sinews. After that, the bones of his fingers and toes were broken with pincers. And so on. They slashed him. They put white ants into his wounds. And they broke all his limbs. And then they finally shot him to pieces. I mean, it's extraordinarily barbaric. Um, and this gives, it, it gives a real flavor of life in this horrific town. If we could have the next um, slide, please. So Lancaster never sailed further east um, than Bantam. He loaded his five ships with spices and headed back to London, where they were sold <laughs> to a considerable profit and to the delight of the company. And it was left to this, the second uh, voyage under William Keeling. Um, here you can see him on a stamp that discovered the Cocos Islands. It was left to him to go and sail even further east to the source of the spicery, so the spice, because it was felt, obviously, if you could go to the source, you'd get even cheaper prices. Keeling is one of my favorite of all the adventurers who sailed to the east. Rather endearingly, he was deeply in love with his wife and tried to take her on the voyage with him. Um, he smuggled her on board and she was discovered as they sailed down the English Channel. And the East India Company had to send a boat after the ship and, and bring her back uh, to shore. And when he arrived back in England about two and a half years later, there she was on the White Cliffs of Dover waving a handkerchief. It's a rather endearing story. Um, 
Keeling also, he realized the importance of keeping his men occupied on board. It was fantastically boring, you know, to be caught in the doldrums. And there was an account in, in one of his diaries, and people have wondered whether it's true or not. The consensus at the moment is it is true that he um, got his men to perform amateur theatricals on board his vessels. And there are the, the first um, recorded um, accounts of um, Shakespeare's plays being performed outside England. So Richard II and Hamlet were both, if we can believe his account, performed on board his ship. Um, ha Richard II was performed on the shores of equatorial Africa. So he sailed off to the Banda Islands. If we could have the next slide, please. So he went first to Bantam and then even further east, another hugely long voyage to the Banda Islands. And here they are. We saw them on the map earlier. Here's the volcano spouting uh, smoke and flames. And that's the main island. Uh, that, it's called Guning Api. Um, and that's the, the main island there as well. Um, Keeling described it as a, a fair, spacious harbor, the, the friendly natives and the staggering quantities of nutmeg um, that could be bought there. And before long, he'd crammed his vessel full of spice um, and was about to return home. But then, the first hint of trouble, three Dutch vessels arrived and they, well, they were outwardly, fr outwardly friendly at first, but they were not entirely happy to discover that Keeling had come here, was here already, um, and they had a lot more guns than he did um, on his ship, and Keeling wrote in his diary that he heard rumors that they mean to surprise us and seize our nutmeg. So as a precaution to this, Keeling moved his ships 10 miles away to those, if you remember the western two islands, Run and I. He moved there, and it was just as well he did, because at that moment, another Dutch fleet arrived, this time under the command of a man named Peter Verhoff, um, who considered the six Bander Islands to be his, his sort of personal preserve, the preserve of the Dutch. And he had no intention of allowing the English to get their hands on any spices. And if we could have the next um, slide, please. The first thing he did was to build this massive and very strong fort on Bandanera. This was the main island in the, that main cluster of islands. And um, with this, really, he could dominate all of the, um, the main four islands of the Bandar Islands and only Run and I, 10 miles to the east, uh, uh, to, the, to the west, um, remained uh, outside the shot of this fort. If we could have the next one. And this is the castle today. It was obviously modified over the decades, um, but it allowed the Dutch to really stamp their authority on this tiny little archipelago. And the Dutch, um, one of the first things they did, they forced, coerced um, the local headmen of the islands to sign a treaty stating that Bandanera was to be placed under Dutch dominion and, as it said, to be kept by us forever. This was the first territorial acquisition of the Dutch in the East Indies, and there were many more to come uh, in the following years. Those local headmen were, meant to, uh, were made to swear in the words of the document that they would thereafter have trade with no other nation whatsoever it were but to sell all their nuts and mace to the Hollanders only. Um, well, Keeling didn't think much of this. He told the Dutch he was going to continue trading with I and Run Islands. Um, he loaded his ships um, at I. If we could just have a next slide, please. This is the rather beautiful, spectacular Paradise Island of I. He loaded his ships with nutmeg here and then sailed back to England. And scarcely had he left than another, the third English voyage arrived. David Middleton, in command of a couple of ships, arrived um, to the absolute despair and horror of the Dutch who were building their forts there. <laughs> um, they rebuked him for coming there, but Middleton, and he was a rather cocky, cocky individual, he simply laughed at everything the Dutch did to him, and he put it, he, he had a lovely line in his diary. He said he thought it was great that the Dutch were having problems with the local population, because he said, knowing that, as he put it, in troubled waters, there is good fishing. Um, he struck a deal with the native islanders of, uh, of I Island here, and he bought a huge quantity of nutmeg. And then, uh, continuing his rather cheeky behavior, he invited the Dutch governor, as it were, to dinner, offering him a chicken pie that had been brought all the way from England. Imagine what the state of that would have been in after several years. And he writes in his diary, and so the past words between us, some sharp and some sweet, but at length they began to be more mild, and the governor called for a cup of wine, and then the company all rose up and drank a cup of wine together. Next slide, please. So far, so good. 
But then this man here enters the picture. This man is called Jan Kern, and he was, um, began his life as a sea captain and worked his way up to become governor general of the Dutch East Indies. He was a most formidable enemy. You didn't want to be on the wrong side of him, and he detested the English. His catchphrase was this, despair not, spare your enemies not, for God is with us. Um, if we can have the next <clears throat> slide, please. So this is just a, uh, a scene of a, a, a sea battle between the English and Dutch. Um, he was forever sinking uh, English ships in the Bay of Bantam. Um, and, you know, he thought nothing of torturing members of the East India Company um, and putting them to death even. He said um, on one occasion, the English, he said, threatened to hang me in effigy on the highest gallows in England and to pickle my heart. He thought this was rather wonderful but he was going to be even harsher um, to the inhabitants of the Bander Islands. If we could have the next slide, please. Yes, this fort here was to play a very important role in what happened next, because in 1614, yet another spice trader arrived, um, uh, captained by Richard Weldon. And when he arrived, the native islanders told him a, a terrible story of deprivation, of violence, of, of appalling treatment at the hands of the Dutch. One of them told Weldon, he said, God has sent the Hollanders as a plague upon us, making wars upon us, and by unjust proceedings, seeking to take our country from us. Well, Weldon uh, procured a huge quantity of nutmeg at Eye Island, um, and uh, infuriating the Dutch in the process. And then um, Admiral Lamb, realizing that Eye Island was causing a lot of problems for the Dutch, decided he was going to capture this island and deprive the English of this island as well, which he now did, and then he executed all of the no local headmen of the island. And there's an account describing the, that execution, saying, the execution was awful to see. The headmen died silently, without uttering any sound, except one of them speaking in the Dutch tongue, said, sirs, have you then no mercy? But Admiral Lamb was decided, de determined to uh, silence the island, islanders forever. And then he built this fort um, on the island of I. It was call, called Fort Revenge, and never was a, a fort better named. So now we have a situation that the Dutch now have control of five of the six Bander Islands. Only run is not in their hands. And if you consider that if they catch a run, they will have a complete global monopoly on the world trade in nutmeg. They'll be able to fix the uh, prices artificially. And so it was to run, if we could have the next slide, please, that this man here, <clears throat> obviously this is not him. This is from the BBC dramatization of the siege of run. Um, but this is supposed to be Nathaniel Courthope, who arrived in run uh, in October 1616, um, and we know a great deal about him because he left um, his diaries and letters which uh, later found their way into the archives of the East India Company. He was fervently anti-Dutch and he realized that if the Dutch were going to be prevented from getting this monopoly, he had to seize Run and hold it at all costs. So defending Run now became his prime mission with him and a, and a small handful of men. If we could just have <clears throat> the next slide, please. So this... This map here again shows the Bander Islands. And you can see why the idea of being able to hold this island with a very small uh, band of men, 30, 40 men, uh, was not entirely mad. It lay about eight or nine miles to the west of the main group. Um, it was populated by islanders who absolutely detested the Dutch. Um, Courthope was told to be very careful when he arrived there and to be very diplomatic. He was told, um, at your arrival at Run, show yourself to be courteous and affable for they are a, 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 a peevish, perverse, diffident, and perfidious people, and apt to take disgust upon small occasions. And if we could have the next slide, here's a couple of the headmen there on, on the left of the picture. The East India Company at the time was not really interested in any territorial acquisitions, but Run was to prove a slightly different case. Um, if Courtauf is to be believed, and I think he probably can be, the um, headmen of the island asked if the English would take them under their protection to save them from Dutch aggression. And they signed this treaty, um, <clears throat> which said that um, the Run and theoretically I Island as well were now to be handed over to the English in perpetuity. And the actual text of the document runs as follows. <clears throat> 
And whereas King James, by the grace of God, is King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, he is also now, by the mercy of God, King of Run and King of I. One of uh, Courthope's men read these lines and Riley remarked that Run would prove infinitely more profitable than Scotland had ever been. Um, there was one, yes, one clause that the headman put in which suggests that uh, the, seamen, the sea dogs did not behave very well. They said that we do desire of his majesty such things as are not fitting for our religion, as unreverent usage of women maintaining swine in our country, forcibly taking away men's goods, misusing of our men, or any such like not to be put into practice. If we could have the next slide... Please. So, with treaty in hand, Courthope now set about defending the island of Run against an army or navy that was um, numbered several thousand Dutch troops. <coughs> Excuse me. What he did is take the ships, uh, take the cannon off his ships, gather all the muskets together, and he in turn intended to turn this into an almost impregnable fortress, sort of fortify the whole island which was not too difficult in a way because it had cliffs, it had, it had strategic positions to place uh, the cannon, to place uh, the muskets. And he felt sure that he could stop the Dutch getting a land a landfall on the island. If we could have the next slide, please. This is the island seen uh, from the east. This is the direction from which the Dutch would sail to it. Sort of rather looks like a, a little bowler, squashed bowler hat. But this picture doesn't tell the whole story. If we could have the, the next one. This, the next slide, please. This, this is a little harbour. This is a, a, a picture from nowadays. Um, now, this is the only anchorage around the coast of Run. So if, if the Dutch are going to invade Run, they have to land their ships here. So, of course, Quarto knew that by placing cannon and, uh, and his muskets strategically, he could effectively block the Dutch from coming into the harbour. And if we could have the next slide, please, as well. And this is that the rest of the coastline around the rest of the island is like this. You can see it's almost impregnable. I mean, you, the only way to get onto the island from the rest of it is to climb up, scale the cliffs with ropes. And the sea, although placid here, is normally extremely uh, choppy and dangerous. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so Courthope remained relatively upbeat um, about his chances. If we could have the next slide, please. Now, this is to prove his principal enemy. This is Lawrence Real, um, the Dutch, uh, at the time, the Dutch commander of the Bander Islands, a formidable man, formidable mathematician, lawyer, um, and also sea captain. Um, and he knows one thing that is not in Courthope's favor, is that Run has very little fresh water and very little food on it as well. And he thinks he can probably starve him out. Um, and he demands that Courthope surrender. said, look, there's no way you're going to win this. Surrender, and I'll save your life. Courthope refuses point blank. I could not, he said, unless I should turn traitor to my king and country and also betray the country people who've surrendered up their land unto our king's majesty. Real was absolutely livid when he heard these words. Apparently, he threw his hat on the ground and pulled his beard for anger. He was a man who was used to getting his own way. Well, if, um, next, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, yes, why didn't the English do more? Well, they had a, a lack of sea power. Uh, the sheer uh, advantage that the Dutch had numerically um, meant a, a very difficult time. There was no supplies, came to Courthope on run. Um, finally, a, a ship called the Solomon did arrive with supplies, with food, everything that uh, Courthope might need. Um, but as she was sailing near to the island, you can imagine the, the men gave a great cheer when they saw this ship coming towards them. And then they looked round, and there were three or four Dutch ships going to attack it. And they watched for about eight hours a, a, a massive sea battle um, that took place. And eventually, the, um, the Solomon was captured. If we could have the next slide, please. And the men were all imprisoned in Fort Revenge, the one you saw earlier. Um, the Dutch tormented the men. It was, it was horrible. They, uh, I'll read an extract from one of the accounts. Um, the Dutch put them underneath the latrines of the castle. And one, one of the Englishmen said, excuse the language, um, they pissed and shat on our heads. And in this manner we lay until such time as we were broken out from top to toe like lepers, having nothing to eat but dirty rice and stinking rainwater. If we could have the next 
The, um, the English East India Company decided they had to do something. They sent out the man here in the armor that you can see on the left of the picture. This was Sir Thomas Dale, who'd sailed to Virginia, brought back Pocahontas, who you can see being baptized in this picture. He was described as um, a heroic lion, and he was sent out, if we can have the next picture, to, to do something to help uh, Nathaniel Courtope and his men. There was a huge sea battle which Sir Thomas, uh, which he won, but he didn't win it convincingly. And Jan Kern, who was fighting him, managed to get away with all his ships intact. Um, and poor old um, Dale sailed off to India, feeling he hadn't really done his best, um, promptly fell sick and died. Um, meanwhile, Courtope and his men were also dying of dysentery. He said, uh, we have rubbed off the skin already, and if we rub any longer, we shall rub to the bone. Um, and in the end, he decides that he has to go and try and make contact with other islanders on other... He, he hears that the headmen on other islands want to have a general uprising. And he sails over. He says, thus he went over, reads the account, that night with boy William, well fitted with muskets and weapons, promising to return in five days. But the Dutch were lying in wait. They spy his little boat, they give chase, they ambush it at night, and opening, open fire with their muskets. And it was 40 against one. Courtope is hit, and he dives into the sea. Um, his end is not long in coming. It was described by the Dutch. Receiving a shot on the breast, he sat down and then leapt overboard in his clothes. And he was never seen again. And that might have been the end of the story, but there, was a, there is a remarkable postscript to this story. If I could have the next uh, slide, please. Um, in retaliation for the Dutch seizing the island of Run and killing Nathaniel Courthope, the English sailed across the North Atlantic and seized this Dutch possession on the north coast of America. This was called New Amsterdam, the island of Manhattan. And um, in the ensuing peace treaty, um, New Amsterdam, if we can have the next slide, please, New Amsterdam became the city of New York. Here it is with its bustling commercial district, its rapidly expanding population, and its vibrant commercial life. And so I always think one can't really help uh, but wonder who got the better deal. If we could have the next slide, please. The Dutch got their beloved island of Run and thereby got control of the world of the global supply of nutmeg. Um, next slide, please. But the English got hold of the city of New York. And a final slide, please. And it was all, as the English nursery rhyme goes, it was all for the sake of a little nut tree. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do apologize for my voice. It's um, too much partying at Jaipur has really done for me. I just think that's a master class in how to present. Uh, uh. What you don't see, of course, is that behind all this is long years in archives reading terrible uh, Jacobean writing in, in secretary hand. Yes, they're extremely difficult to... I should just point out, actually, I wrote this book 20 years ago, so when William said, oh, you must talk about Nathaniel's nutmeg, I said, well, I can't really remember it, you know, <laughs> so I had to read it again to get, my, get fresh. Um, yes, the archives of the East India Company, they are absolutely remarkable. I mean, you know them well as well. Um, the East India Company kept absolutely everything, not just the official reports, the, the ships, uh, the accounts of the ships, the journals, what have you, but they managed to collect the diaries and the letters of all the men. Um, and one of the books I wrote about the first Englishman in Japan, William Adams, they he had every single letter um, written by the seven or eight traders who were there, and, and they, they tell it as it is. So, wonderful resource for any historian. But, um, again, it isn't written in English as we know it. It's written in a, in a, in a uh, almost like Cyrillic script that they developed called, company, uh, called, called the Com Secretary Hand. Yes, and it, it really is very difficult to, to read. It looks like a, a sort of spider has in walked in an ink pot and then you know, trotted across the page. Um, very, very hard to read. But your eyes do get accustomed to it, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you literally have to decode it and, and you sit there with, I mean, about half the letters are familiar, as with Cyrillic script. Yes. You, know, you, you can read them straight off. Uh, one half are completely unfamiliar. And you have to sit there with this sort of key on your desk, you know, literally typing letter after letter into your computer. And it, it, well, certainly to start with, it took me a, a morning to read 
two letters. Yeah, no, it's yeah. very, very time consuming. Now, some of these, of course, were published um, in uh, at the height of Victorian imperialism. They loved the story of these, these bold merchant adventurers. And there was a, a society formed called the Hacklet Society, named after Richard Hacklet, who was the great promoter of overseas voyages in the Elizabethan court. Um, and they published a lot of these. And, and so they did come, some of the journals came to a wider, wider audience. And then there's uh, um, Foster's Factories in India. There's, yes. there's a, six, seven, 10, 17 volumes or something, something extraordinary. Yes, I think, um, didn't Foster, I think he worked with his sort of daughter, Ethel, and uh, <laughs> poor old Ethel, who <laughs> remained a spinster all her life, was busy copying out this crabbed hand from the East, East, East India Company letters. But the, being the Victorian period, they edit out all the interesting stuff. So when I was, I was writing White Wiggles, I was basically looking for accounts of sex um, and, and, and didn't find any of it in, um, in Foster. But then, so I had to go back to the original letters. Uh, and um, they were all, and I think they were, they were re-catalogued by Foster, so when he'd finished. So it was quite easy to tabulate from his book. To, but half the letters that have anything about you know, intimate relationships with, with Indians in Agra and Delhi and Surat, um, which is the subject of White Moogles, uh, is edited out. And there were these whole chapters about the first Englishman to have a, uh, an Indian wife called Joshua Blackwell. And it was a huge scandal because he ran away from the factory and, and went off living and lived in Agra and in lovely Haveli uh, with this lovely girl. Um, and obviously was having a lovely time. Uh, and he, Foster just edits the whole story out and all mention of Joshua Blackwell is... Yeah, I found that the men's letters were, were, were much more useful. They, they really recorded absolutely everything. Um, no holes barred. There's one wonderful account, I mean, a horrible account, but it, fascinating to read of, of the, these merchants in Japan, the traders in Japan. They wanted to go and see, do a bit of sightseeing, and they went to the great Copper Buddha at Kamakura, and they describe, um, only the English would do this, they managed to get inside the Buddha, and they describe hollering and hallowing and making all sorts of noise and terrifying all the locals. And then in time-honored <laughs> English tradition, they end their visit to the Buddha by, um, by uh, vandalizing it, scratching their names into the copper. Um, op open to you guys. Uh, first question. I just wondered, prior to the peace treaty that swapped New York for run, did the British make any attempt to thwart there being a monopoly by taking some nutmeg trees and planting them somewhere else so that the six Bander Islands weren't the only place in the world where you had nutmeg? Well, that's an interesting question. It, it is exactly what happened. And in fact, when the, run, uh, when the, the treaty was signed, giving a signing run to, to the English, um, the symbolic gesture that the headmen uh, performed uh, for Nathaniel Courtope was to give him a, a nutmeg seed, seedling enclosed in the earth of run, because uh, this was sort of more than symbolic. It was meaning you can, you know, you, you can go and plant this. And of course, um, it was not long after after the Dutch got their monopoly, that exactly that happened. The English took nutmeg seedlings, and it was difficult to grow elsewhere, but they planted it obviously in the West Indies, and I think in, in, in India as well, uh, it, was, it was planted, yeah. In, in Kerala, the Malabar yeah, coast. Right, yeah. um, one question, how long did nutmeg, I mean, after it began to be more widely available in the West, how, how quickly did it cease to be interesting, so to speak, and end up back in our spice cupboards? Well, rather wonderfully, <laughs> rather wonderfully, um, almost as soon as the Dutch got their monopoly on it, <laughs> which is rather fantastic. Um, it was realized that it had absolutely no medicinal properties whatsoever. So, yeah, and when you think about it, you know, it is a withered little nut. You know, it's, do you really want to spend several gold sovereigns on one of these? I wondered if you could explain how, uh, when they produced that tree, who, who would have been able to translate? How, how was the ability to translate in ancient Indonesian into ancient English um, achieved? And the second thing is, because we tend to think of these adventures in, modern, in our modern experience, jumping on a jet plane and flying across, how on earth could poor old Corto send messages back to London and ask for help? Because it would take months and months for, for that to... Yes. Turn around to occur. On the question of language, it's, it's fascinating. These, most of the, 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 it's just the common sea dogs who set sail. Most of them had, when they speak English, most of them had um, a, a good knowledge of Dutch and some knowledge of Portuguese. So once you were out in the East, then you would find a Portuguese who, who, who knew uh, the local language or a Dutchman who knew the local language. And what's extraordinary is that even when the nations were at war, they would still cooperate on, the, on these things. Um, but they were also incredibly quick to learn. I mean, William Adams in Japan, he was washed up there in 1600. Within a year, he spoke almost uh, fluent Japanese. 
So uh, some of them must have been absolutely remarkable linguists. I suppose if you, if you, if you need the language to survive, then it's quite a motivation for, um, you know, for learning it. Time for one more. At the back, lady at the back. Thank you. Well, when I get back to my home in England and I'm standing in my kitchen grating nutmeg, I will certainly look at it in a very different way. <laughs> um, what I'm sort of curious about, um, people went through horrendous things, as you've been telling us, to acquire the spices and nutmeg. But how, what, how was the desire for these spices created in the British Isles and other places? Um, and how, how, how was it used, um, you know, given the traditional British way of uh, being allergic to uh, new tastes? I'm remembering particularly garlic, which was later regarded with great suspicion. Mm. Well, well, I mean, the spices have been known uh, and available in some quantities as long back, uh, way back in the early Middle Ages. Uh, Chaucer, of course, mentions various um, uh, uh, beers and drinks that were laced with ginger and other, other spices. But they were, you know, incredibly expensive because they, they came overland at that point to Venice and then, and then they passed through so many middlemen um, that they were just beyond the reach of almost everyone. Um, the, the other answer to that question is that, surprisingly, Tudor cooking was actually rather like Indian cooking at the time. Mm. And, and it, it, for old Kashmiri cooking today, uh, it's full of fruit. It's full of uh, stews with, with lots of, of, of fruit and spice in it. Uh, and um, Indian cooking at this period didn't have the chili yet, widely. Um, but Elizabethan cooking had spice and, uh, and, and they used to... Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Raj at Table by a guy called David Burton that makes this point over a whole chapter that when the first British went to India, the cooking there was rather similar to the, what, the cooking at home. Mm. One last quick question, sir. A question, if possible. Will you please elaborate the 1584 expedition which you mentioned during the course of your paper, the lecture, that clarification? Um, you are, so um, the gentleman is asking about, I mentioned the 1584 expedition to Virginia, to the New World. In brief, um, this was Sir Walter Raleigh, who'd been granted the rights to settle North America, um, decided rather wisely to send out an exploratory um, expedition before he took um, settlers and planters to go out there. This was the 1584 expedition. Um, notably, it brought back two members um, of the native indigenous population, um, brought them back to London so that um, the, uh, the settlers They were could, kidnapped. kidnapped. Uh, kid, probably kidnapped, yes. Brought back to London so that the settlers would have some knowledge of the local language um, when they went back there. Um, the, uh, the whole Sir Walter Riley colonizing ex expedition uh, project is absolutely fascinating. He brought in the greatest minds of, the of his generation. Thomas Harriot was the man that compiled the first English Algonquian dictionary um, as early as 1585. Ladies and gentlemen, please a huge round of applause for Giles Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you. He will be signing his books, as will I, in the signing tent over here. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, please thank our guests, Giles Milton and William Dalrymple. Now, Giles will be signing his book on the left-hand side, just between Darba Hall and Batak. So if you'd like to ask any other further questions or have your book signed, please go and see him there. Now, our authors and the festival would kindly ask for your help to keep Diggy Palace clean, so please check around you for any